to uh, today's lectures, um, to the ASP Summer Colloquium on S2S Science. Um, uh, today, um, we're going to talk about the Madden-Julian oscillation and teleconnections and predictability coming from the Madden-Julian oscillation on the S2S timescale. And our first speaker is Hemi Kim. Hemi is a professor at uh, Stony Brook University. Um, her interests lie in low frequency climate variability and predictability. Um, topical extratropical interactions, S2S prediction, and extreme events uh, having such as atmospheric rivers, tropical cyclones, uh, and, uh, and tropical cyclones. And she has also dabbled in machine learning. So Hemi, we are looking very forward to your presentation. You're on mute, Hemi. Okay, thank you very much. Let me turn off my uh, video for a uh, better connection. Okay, uh, today I will talk about the predictability and prediction of the Madden-Julian oscillation. And just to um, remind you what we have learned so far, because last week uh, at the beginning, uh, first few days, we learned a lot about MJO and then um, so I want to just remind you. Um, so we we are talking about this S2S time scale, which is too long for the atmospheric initial condition to um, to keep the memory, but too short for the boundary condition to um, to take an effect. So, um, but this S2S time scale, the forecast scale has been improved a lot in the recent decade. And one of the source of uh, the predictability is the Madden-Julian oscillation. And um, the Madden-Julian oscillation is not just in the tropics, but the diabetic heating and related, uh, the related uh, uh, circulation, it has an impact on the globe. So it has a lot of uh, global uh, weather and climate phenomena are modulated by the MJO. And also we learned about uh, how the ARC interaction uh, is important for the MJO and also the stratosphere and uh, troposphere coupling is also important for MJO. So I'm sure that you are now convinced that MJO is an important source for the subseasonal predictability. And this talk, uh, we will talk about how well do the models predict uh, the Madden-Julian oscillation. So first of all, for uh, MJO prediction, we need a some good index that represents the Madden-Julian oscillation, such as a linear, uh, like Nino 3.4 index. And um, here it shows the 3D structure of the MJO. Uh, here you can see the convection and the low level, uh, low level 850 millibar uh, zonal wind, uh, low level convergence and upper level divergence. So uh, the MJO convection is tightly coupled to the circulation and uh, to so to define MJO in the real-time forecast, we need some index, and that index is uh, used with this ORR and the low-level wind, the 850 uh, zonal wind and 200 millibar zonal wind. So using these three uh, indices, uh, three variables, we can uh, have an index. This is called the real-time uh, multivariate MJO index. You have heard about the RMM index. And that was developed by Will and Hendon in 2004. So what it is, is basically you have ORR and the wind field, upper level, low level wind, and then uh, uh, you, did, you do uh, several pre-processing and then average it over the tropics, 15 degrees south and north, and do the EUF. So this is the eigenvector of the eigenvector uh, first and second mode. And uh, this shows the PC time series. So this PC time series is the RMM one and two. And you can see that uh, um, over the time, there is some time when the RMM index is, is large. So that is when the MJO amplitude, we say uh, it's big. And then in some times it is near zero, the anomaly is near zero. So we can assume that the MJO is weak. And we also can put that in this phase space diagram that you have seen before. And uh, this, you can see uh, uh, using this eigenvector and P, uh, the RMM index, we can define uh, the MJO location into eight phases. So it's from one to eight, and you see uh, phase two and three is when it is in the Indian Ocean. And using that, we also can uh, make a composite. So it's called a life cycle composite. And then you see this uh, shading is the ORR and the wind field, low level wind field. So we can define eight phases. And you see that, uh, for example, when 
And there is in phase two or three, they are uh, in the Indian Ocean. And then we have the uh, low level easterly in the, to the east. So, and then uh, how can we use this index for monitoring and forecast? So here, this shows an example of an very active MGO event that occurred in April 25, uh, 2019. And that was uh, defined as phase three. So you can see the uh, large convective area here uh, near the, in, in the Indian Ocean. And here, in the, if you go to the CPC website, they provide the real-time forecast uh, updated almost every day. And then you see this, this is the observation. So here, the uh, red line is the observation. And here is the uh, April 25. So, so you see this here. It is in phase three, which corresponds to this pattern. And then uh, they provide the forecast. So this is NCEP GFS forecast. And uh, it, is, it provides ensemble and also ensemble mean. So the talk today is about uh, how well do the models predict the MJO and especially uh, the RMM indices. In this Okay, so this shows the uh, RMM index prediction skill. So when we, ha uh, we have the Heinke, so we can compare the RMM index uh, with the observation, and this shows the skill of the, uh, the, the, the uh, dash lines are the S2S models, and the, uh, the solid lines are the sub X models. So this is a, a combination of a few papers. And you can see that uh, the correlation coefficient, if you take the 0.5 as a, a reference, then you see uh, the, the, the black line is the ECMWF model, which is about uh, 32 days. And then uh, uh, except this one, most of the models are ranged uh, between uh, three to four weeks and maximum approximately four weeks. So that is the uh, current, let's say, current uh, MJO forecast uh, cap capability using this RMM index. Okay, so um, the MGO prediction has a uh, not that long history actually, and that is because we did not have the uh, computational resources to do a lot of Heinke's experiment. So um, here this shows the lead time in weeks, and this is the uh, predictability. So predictability, MGO predictability is the hypothetical uh, prediction skill assuming that the numerical model is perfect. And uh, studies have shown that if uh, uh, the model is perfect, then we can predict the MJO up to seven weeks. Uh, in the early uh, days, we use, uh, when we do not have the uh, numerical, good numerical models, people use the statistical models based on linear regression or uh, many, uh, yeah, based on linear models. And the prediction skill was about three, maximum three weeks. It was uh, between two and three weeks. And uh, uh, with numerical models before 2008, so here the, uh, the years represent the, 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 the publication years. So the uh, studies that published before 2008, they showed that with the numerical models, MGO can be predicted about uh, two weeks. And then in the recent years, uh, we show that uh, on average, they, are pre they can predict the MGO for approximately four weeks. And uh, I'm not going to cover everything here, but uh, uh, if you go to this, uh, the, the, if you read this review paper, there are more details and um, I may only cover about 20% of this paper. So here, this shows the continued one example of how the uh, MJO has been uh, improved. And this shows the uh, ECMWF model. Uh, here, the red line is the point six correlate when we uh, take the correlation point six, and every year the model is uh, upgraded, and then you see this continuous improvement of the uh, MGO RMM prediction skill. And especially here, you see between uh, this the, the, the 2006 and 2008, there was a big jump, and that is when the model changes its uh, convective scheme in a way that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the convection is more sensitive to the environmental moisture. So you see this uh, improvement. And today what I will talk is about the consensus and key issues in terms of MJO uh, prediction. So. Um, just to summarize, the consensus among many studies is that prediction skill is higher with strong MJO in the initial condition. 
So when there's a stronger signal in the initial condition, then we can predict the MDO better. And skill is higher in boreal winter, and that's because we have more well-organized MJO, stronger MJO, and skill is sensitive to initial MJO phase. So when the MJO is initialized in Indian Ocean versus Western Pacific, the, the skill is different. Uh, there are and etc. And there are many issues. And uh, one thing that I want to uh, emphasize is the quick decay of the uh, propagation when you cross the merit, uh, maritime continent. So first of all, let's talk. Uh, let's see how the ensembles plays a role in the MGO prediction. So here this shows uh, the S2S models and uh, the, uh, the yellow is the control run. So this is the when the forecast, the, this is the forecast lead time when RMM skill reach 0.6. So here you see all the uh, control values, con uh, control simulations are, are less than the ensemble mean. And in some models, like the ECMWF or CNRM or BOM, you can see a big jump, a big improvement when the ensemble mean is taken. And these are the models which has large ensembles. So if you have more ensembles, then uh, usually they have a, a better skill. But it's not always the case. The H HMCR has also large ensembles, but you can see the decrease of the skill. Another uh, consensus is that uh, the model has uh, uh, the, on, uh, the, the ensemble system is under dispersive. You have heard a lot about this, and this shows the, um, uh, the from Nina et al. Uh, this shows that the solid lines are the ensemble spread, and the, uh, the dashed line are the uh, ensemble mean root mean square error. So you can see this ensemble spread is smaller than the uh, root mean square error. And, these were the earlier versions of, uh, this was the first hind, intraseasonal hindcast simulation, coordinated hindcast simulation launched in 2009. And uh, even in the current S2S and sub-X models, they are all on the dispersive. Uh, another uh, thing that I want to emphasize is the QBMJ connection that was covered by Yaga uh, Richter, et al., uh, Richter uh, last week. And this is because before this QBO MJO connection, uh, before we find this connection, there was not much uh, studies about the, how the large scale climate can uh, modulate the MJO prediction skill. But then a uh, the few papers showed that the MJO is more active in the EQBO winter. So here, this is the uh, difference of the uh, MJO activity between EQBO uh, and the climatology. So you can see this in the easterly QBO winter, they, they are much stronger than the westerly QBO. And uh, in uh, a recent, recent paper by Jane Martin, you can see uh, that there's, uh, we have a, a review paper on this QBO MJO connection. So you can find more details on, uh, in this paper. So now, if the QBO uh, modulates the MJO, then the prediction skill will be different as well. So here, this shows the uh, paper by Xu Gang Wang. Uh, here is the MGO prediction skill in the S2S models, and he used the OMI index. OMI is another index. It's the ORR-based MGO index, so it does not uh, uh, include the wind field, but it's only ORR-based, uh, so it's only convection. And then you see that uh, in all models, the blue is uh, bigger than the red. So that means all in all models, the easterly QBO have better MGO prediction skill than the uh, westerly QBO winter. But then uh, one thing to notice is that even the low top models, so here the box, uh, the, uh, the, the green box that represents these models here, which is classified as low top models. And still you can see that uh, there is a big difference uh, in the uh, in the MGO prediction skill bit between QBO phases, even the model does not have any uh, QBO or stratospheric uh, variability. So um, in our current study, uh, we showed that the skill, there is a difference in prediction skill, which agrees, uh, which uh, all the all recent studies showed, but maybe the uh, prediction skill difference is not statistically significant. And here uh, is a nice uh, editor highlights by uh, Shidong Zhang. So emerging co controversy in Madden Julian oscillation prediction. So here, uh, in uh, this covers our recent paper, and that is, for example, uh, here it shows the sub X and S two S models, and the, uh, this is the MGO prediction scale in EQBO and Western QBO, and the thick lines are where the difference of MGO skill is statistically significant. 
And when you have more samples, there are some uh, more significant um, uh, uh, time, times when we have more significant difference, but then, then most of the models do not have that much, uh, that enough samples to, uh, to get this uh, statistically significant difference of a QBO. So that is one thing um, that is uh, that I want to highlight. And then uh, another key issue in terms of MGO uh, uh, prediction is the MGO propagation. So here, let me uh, show you this one first. So here, what is shown is the amplitude bias. So y axis is the initial phase, and this is ECMWF model, which is in the S2S uh, database. And here, the um, the brown shading is the weaker. So that means when the MJO prediction starts in earlier phases, when it is uh, in the Indian Ocean or the maritime continent, then it loses its uh, amplitude very fast compared to other phases. And that is actually in all uh, in most of the um, most of the. Uh, models, you can see in NCA CSM1, you also lose the uh, amplitude fast. And then in the later phases, it's getting stronger. So, but in, in overall, in all models, you can see that in all your phases, when the MGO is over the Indian Ocean, then I lose its amplitude faster. So there is a quick decay of MGO signal when the MGO starts in the Indian Ocean and propagates through the maritime continent. And this shows the um, paper by Vitar et al. And, uh, and it shows the percentage of MGO events not crossing the maritime continent. So the MJO starting from Indian Ocean and not crossing uh, the maritime continents. You see in ERA interim, there are only uh, based on their metrics, it's only 10% that do not cross the maritime continent. But then in the S2S models, you can see that there, there are uh, almost as uh, twice as large as uh, the observation. So, and, um, so that means there are more events that do not cross the maritime continent and we call this as the MJO maritime continent prediction propagation barrier. So uh, if you put that in this uh, phase space diagram, so here you see uh, the, the, the composite of multimodal means. So this is a uh, multimodal average of eight sub X and S2S models. And here the black line is the observation. So the composite uh, of observation and the, the blue is the multimodal mean and the open circles are the individual models and corresponding observation. So for example, uh, you can see that in, for example, in phase two, uh, the model cannot, the model, this is a three day average uh, running mean. So you can see that the model already have a big uh, discrepancy between the, uh, in, in the initial, like in the first three days. So they are already uh, weakened. And also in the phase, uh, and then uh, as it propagates, the, the, the amplitude gets uh, weaker. So, and then in all, some phases, in the later phases, uh, they are actually a little bit stronger. And then in some phases, um, there, there is an amplitude error and also phase error. So, and especially the Indian Ocean, these ones, uh, we try to understand why they are, uh, they are, they lose their amplitude so fast. So this shows the, uh, first day forecast after initial uh, MJO phase two. So here this shows the NOAA ORL and the ERA interim uh, window anomalies. And here is the um, observation. I just called this as an observation. And then you have the MJO and associated uh, low level uh, easterly wind to the east of the convection. And then uh, this is the ECMWF, the first day forecast. And you already see the, uh, uh, the, the, that the, the uh, convective anomaly has um, weaker amplitude than the observation. And then if you put that in the in the Hofmuller diagram, you see this is a y axis is forecast day. And here you see in observation, the uh, shading is overall and the uh, control is the uh, U850 anomaly, uh, taking the average between 15 degrees south and north. And see this in the observation, it propagates through the maritime continent, which is approximately uh, 120 east. And then, uh, but in the ECMWF, uh, it does not. And the reason why I show the ECMWF model is in the paper, we have all models, but this uh, is because it's the best model. So we try to understand uh, how the model, how does the model mean, mean state or the mean bias impact the MGO propagation processes. 
And this is from uh, Monday's Shidong's lecture. And here is the uh, here. There are many theories as you have seen before, but we try to understand this uh, maritime continent barrier using the moisture mode theory. And long story short, uh, if you just focus on the eastward propagation, it is that the large scale horizontal and vertical moisture advection by the circulation uh, uh, that moisten the troposphere and then uh, makes the convection center to uh, to move. So here you have. To the east, we have this uh, advection and uh, more moisture, so that MJO moves to the uh, east. And uh, we show th this is the observation. For example, uh, here is the winter mean moisture Q850, and uh, this is specific humidity at 850. And the reason why I'm showing only one level is because the sub X models only provide the Q850. So I have to match this. And uh, here, this is the mean state. So here, uh, uh, there are many uh, uh, other terms, but if you just focus on this moisture advection, this is the V prime uh, that uh, gradient Q bar. So Q bar is the mean moisture and the gradient of mean moisture, and we have the MJO wind, right? So uh, here on the bottom, it shows the day one MJO in the observation. So let's say we have MJO active, MJO active convective uh, convection in the Indian Ocean and related Kevin wave response, and then the suppressed MJO uh, induced the Rossby wave response. And then there will be a moisture advection because the mean moisture is uh, has its uh, maximum near here. So uh, the, the gradient will uh, make this the moisture advection with the wind. So, and then if you compare the observation, the moisture advection, you can see that the moisture advection is large uh, in, this, in this area. And then uh, after 10 days in observation, uh, they propagate through uh, the maritime continent. MGO propagates through the maritime continent where the moisture advection is large. And of course, there are also other uh, 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 processes, but here I will just focus on this one. And then the question is then if the models, the sub X and S2S models, do the, the models uh, uh, capture this moisture advection? And maybe not because they do not propagate very well. So here uh, the bottom is the same with the previous one. And then uh, here this shows the uh, moisture advection term aver uh, average over this region. So here in observation in the first uh, about 10 days, there's a positive moisture uh, advection. But in the multimodal means, sub X and S2S model do not have this uh, strong moisture advection. So they get much weaker uh, very fast. And uh, this, these are the individual model. In the observation, the uh, moisture advection is strong, but then uh, in the individual models, all models have weaker advection. So um, if you think about this, this term, uh, the MJ wind can also impact this advection term, but uh, studies have shown that the mean moisture distribution is important for the MJ propagation that you showed uh, last week from uh, Charlotte Demote's uh, presentation. And here this shows again the observed Q850, and this is the bias, so this is multimodal mean minus observation. So what you see here is that uh, all models actually have this very dry bias in the lower troposphere. So this is 850, uh, and then uh, you see this dry bias. So the models are drier, and if it is dry and more dry in the near the equator, then it will weaken the uh, gradient of the moisture. So there will be less uh, weaker moisture advection because the gradient is weaker. And then uh, the mod ECMWF model provides all level of the uh, specific humidity. So we can put, uh, we can uh, make this, uh, this plot here. And what you see here is the uh, Q, bias as a function of lead time. So what you see here is at the beginning, there's uh, um, uh, at the beginning, there's already dry atmosphere and then it, uh, it continues to get drier and continues to amplify. So um, yeah, so there is some biases and the mean state and that may impact this propagation and prediction skill. Of course, there are many other theories and that can be applied, but we use uh, the one theory. Uh, another approach is the, um, so here recently we did a, uh, some, applied some deep learning for MGO bias correction. So the hypothesis is, you can see here uh, that the bias, if the bias is systematic in a specific MGO phase, for example, uh, in Indian Ocean, they always get weaker 
systematically and in the Western Pacific, they are uh, always stronger, then uh, it can be corrected by op optimal bias correction method, right? So, but uh, it hasn't uh, done before. And uh, what we use is to, to correct this, the bias, we use the LSTM. So this is the long uh, short term memory. Uh, there are many uh, different approaches in the, for the deep learning, but we use the very simple one. And uh, here, the input is the SGS model RMM1 and 2, and output is the observed RMM1 and 2 during the uh, training period. And then in the real forecast period, we can put the SGS models and then get the corrected, uh, corrected RMM index. So this model is built separately for each phase, model and forecast lead time. And we did the real time forecast and also leave one year out cross validation. Um, and this is the result. So here again, the, the black and uh, blue is the, the blue is S2S, black is the observation, and then uh, the red is after uh, applying the deep learning method for the bias correction. So what is interesting is that uh, the first day is uh, closer to the observation, and then uh, the following uh, predictions get uh, is also closer. Uh, to the observation. So even in the uh, in the later phases, like phase six or seven, they get closer. The, the stronger amplitude gets weaker, uh, gets more realistic, and uh, the, the the bias is uh, the, the the bias the error is reduced. And then the MGO propagation is this is observation. This is uh, ECMWF model. We see that uh, the the weak uh, amplitude after 14 days, but then after uh, making this uh, deep learning correction, it is almost, uh, we can see this propagation and the dot is where the anomalies are significant. Um, and this is the uh, focus error using the deep learning method. So here, this shows the subjects and S2S models. So first of all, the um, this is, so we can divide uh, the, Focus error into amplitude and phase error using some metrics. And then here it shows the multimodal mean. Uh, this is four weeks average. So here uh, the blue shadings are S2S, and then the uh, red or uh, pink shading is the uh, after deep learning. And the light shading is the amplitude error. The, uh, the dark shading is the phase error. And you can see that it's on average about 84% uh, reduced. Um, so let me summarize. Um, yeah, so we have seen a lot of progresses in the last decade, and uh, we still have about three weeks uh, room for improvement. And uh, I like to share some thought in terms of the uh, in terms of the current understanding of MJO prediction. So challenges and question. So first of all. Uh, is the MJO predictable up to four weeks, really? I mean, here it shows the four weeks, but keep in mind that we use the RMM index, which is highly filtered. You take the uh, latitudinal average, and then uh, in this index, we use three, uh, three different variables, but mainly the upper level wind, the U200 takes the dominant role. So if we use the OMI index, or only index, or maybe um, Shui's uh, large scale precipitation tracking method, maybe we, we, don't, we may not see this uh, good prediction skill. Or even the, uh, so these are just the index, right? The RMM OMIR uh, index, the time series. And um, can the model actually uh, capture the spatial pattern? And here this shows the ORR pattern correlation skill over the Indo, uh, Indo Pacific. And uh, the, here the blue, this is the correlation coefficient, and the blue is the, the ECMWF model. So if you if we compare the ORR pattern correlation to capture the ORR pattern related with MJO, it only goes up to uh, six days, so it's not that good. So uh, keep in mind that the RMM index is a uh, highly uh, filtered data, and also it has the more um, impact from the upper level wind. So it depends on what you defined as an MJO. If you, if you think the uh, convection is the MJO, then uh, the RMM index may provide too optimistic uh, view on the um, MJO prediction scale. Another thing that uh, is to how to improve the MJO propagation and the related 3D structure. There have been some studies with uh, changing model physics resolution initialization 
etc. But uh, as you know, they are uh, mainly based on the on uh, 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 case studies because it, what uh, to do this the sensitivity test of these changes, then you need a huge uh, computational cost to do a, a long-term Heinke simulation. And also uh, do model simulate diverse MGO types. Again, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the presentation by Shui Chen last week, um, there are diverse MGO types. For example, here, this is a paper by Bin Wang and it shows different uh, four types of MGO. This is standing MGO, jumping MGO, slow MGO, fast MGO. So do the model simulate all these uh, types and also the related physical mechanism. Uh, the last one I want to ask is the do models capture the large scale climate modulation on MJO? For example, not only the QBO, but maybe the ENSO and IO, the Indian Ocean Dipole may have uh, influence on the MJO. But again, uh, to, uh, to uh, understand the large scale climate modulation, we need even more longer set of the uh, the high cast, right? Only like 15 years is not enough to separate it into uh, the, the El Nino La Nina phases. So uh, that's all, and I'm happy to take any question. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hemi. It was a very comprehensive overview of MJO.